what we discovered last time is that there is actually proof in science, but only in very limited number of cases. That's only formal science when you actually get proof. If you look at anything above and beyond formal science, if you focus on social science, natural science, all knowledge is fallible. I think at this point it should be clear why it's fallible. You're going to have to think about three reasons. The problem of sensations, the problem of induction, and the problem of theory relatedness. So that should be enough to convince anyone that all knowledge in empirical science is fallible. All theories in empirical science are fallible. And yet, we believe that some theories are better than others. And basically, that's the reason why we don't teach Aristotelian physics. If you go to the Department of Physics, you're not going to study any Aristotelian physics or any Cartesian physics, God forbid. We do teach Aristotelian physics and Cartesian physics, but only in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science and only out of historical curiosity. But we don't present those theories as the best available descriptions of reality. A question immediately arises. Why do we prefer our currently accepted theories? What makes one theory better than another? In other words, how do we decide which theories should be accepted? This is our question today. But before we get to that, we have to clarify what acceptance is. I'm going to give you three definitions, and I want you to understand the difference between these three definitions. The first one is acceptance. A theory is said to be accepted if it is considered the best available description of its object. Now, what's object? The object could be something physical, a fallen apple, or a revolving planet. The object could be something social, a group of people, individual human being, social institution like government, or it could be formal, like a number or a logical relation. In any case, you have some object that a theory tries to describe. A theory is said to be accepted if we believe that it is the best available description of its respective object. Is this clear? Very good. Now, this should be differentiated from use. We say that theory is used when there is a practical application for it regardless of whether it's accepted or not accepted. I'm going to explain this. And the final category is pursuit. A theory may or may not be accepted. There may or may not be any particular use for the theory. But you may find the theory worthy of further elaboration. You may have this idea, you say, you know what, I have this vague idea. I know that it's not the best on the market because it's just a vague idea. I know that there's not much use for it at the moment. But I think it's something worthy of further elaboration. We have to work in that direction. Essentially, every scientific endeavor starts from that, when you have this vague idea. Think of Einstein around 1900, when he had that idea of you know, curved space-time and all those sorts of things. There was no theory to speak of at the moment, not much theory, but there was this guiding idea. So in those cases, when we believe that a theory or an idea is worthy of further elaboration, we say that the theory is pursued. I'm going to give you some examples. Let's take a timeline. 200 years ago, 400 years ago, we have accepted theories, used theories, pursued theories. Let's start from the contemporary state of affairs here. If I asked you which theories, which physical theories you think best describe the physical world, what would you say? Probably say, well, general relativity, quantum physics. That's what you would say. These two theories provide us with the best available description of physical processes. But if I asked you, which theory do you use in any sort of technology, in technological applications? Okay, sometimes we use some general relativity, yes, in 0.00001% of all projects, maybe we use some general relativity. We also use some quantum physics. Do we have any engineers here? Which theory we use to build a bridge. Do you really use general relativity or quantum physics? Which one? In 99% of all practical applications, we still use the good old Newtonian physics elaborated by several generations of physicists, despite the fact that we no longer believe that that theory provides the best available description of reality. We don't believe that there is empty space. We don't believe that things affect each other at a distance, that there is this force of gravity. We do not accept the theory. 
But it's very useful because its calculations are easy and simple compared to calculations based on general relativity and quantum physics. In theory, you could do everything with quantum physics, general relativity, you could do those things, but it would be enormously complicated. And that's the reason why we still use good old classical physics, despite the fact that we do not accept it. We do not believe it's the best available description, but it's useful. It's a useful calculating tool. So as an engineer, if your task is to build a bridge, you're going to stick to classical physics, unless it's a transcosmic bridge, in which case you'll probably have to take into account some general relativity effects. But other than that, you're going to stick to your classical physics. Now, if I asked you which theories you think most physicists pursue these days, what is it that they work on elaborating? You'd probably say, well, it's a superstring theory. One version or another. It's a whole bunch of them. And uh, in the 90s, a theory was created, which is called M-theory, which allegedly unites many different theories in this field. I'm going to explain this later on. But essentially, this theory is widely pursued because we believe that this is going to be, or there is a chance that it might be the next big thing in physics. But we do not accept it. Not at the moment. We do not believe it's the best available description of reality. Do you see the difference? Accepted theories, used theories, pursued theories. Sometimes, sometimes the three coincide. If you had a time machine, if we went back to the early 19th century, the accepted theory, the used theory, and the pursued theory was all the same. All Newtonian physics it was the theory they taught in the universities, the theory they used in practical applications, and a the theory they tried to elaborate. But cases such as this one are far and few between. In most cases, you get a situation which is very similar to what we have nowadays. 400 years ago, you have your Aristotelian medieval natural philosophy, or Aristotelian physics, and then you had your Aristotelian medieval cosmology. But if your task was, let's say, to calculate the future position of a certain planet, let's say planet Venus, you couldn't really use any of these theories because these theories didn't have any serious calculating capacity. The theory that they used was this one, Ptolemaic astronomy. That's what they used. Another theory they used was Copernicus's theory. You understand that they believed that the Earth was in the center of the universe. And yet this theory, Copernicus's theory, which was only about 50 years old at that time, proved very useful in calculating positions of planets. And in fact, some of the astronomers used both of these theories at the same time, simultaneously. You see, it's possible. And finally, when it came to pursuit theories, they pursued, obviously, versions of uh, Copernican theory. You have Galileo, Kepler, and many others, and a Tychonic astronomy, a whole bunch of different astronomical ideas. The whole market of astronomy was full of different theories, different ideas. So there you have it, the difference between acceptance, use, and pursuit. Now, a few things before we move on. I'm not going to talk about pursuit because it's very difficult to say from the outset which idea is worthy of further elaboration and which idea is not. You never know what's going to grow from what. I'm not going to talk about that. Now, I'm not going to talk about use because from a practical standpoint, what you have is basically an accumulation of tools in your toolbox. Think of it as a toolbox. If you're an engineer, you don't really care which theory is accepted, which theory is not accepted. The way you see science is basically you have a huge toolbox of different theories. You have your hammers, your cutters, your screwdrivers, whatever. And when a new theory arrives on a market, you should not necessarily discard your previous tools. You can have a new hammer or new screwdriver and use it together with the previous one. So this is the engineer's approach. When you don't care about acceptance, you care about use. And this is true not just in physical engineering. This is also true in social engineering or in any sort of engineering. If you want to open an astrology boutique, you don't really care whether astrology is accepted or not. What you care is whether it brings money. Right? That's what you care about. That's the whole point. So I'm not going to be talking about use. Here, acceptance is something very special. Because you see, you cannot accept two incompatible theories at the same time. You can use them at the same time. You can pursue different incompatible theories at the same time. But when it comes to acceptance, you have to choose. You can't believe that the Earth is both flat and spherical. It's impossible. You have to choose. So the question is, how do we decide which theory is the best available description of its object? This is the question. 
We have a couple of theories. We have some evidence. In order to decide which of the two theories is better, clearly this is not enough. What we also need is a list of rules or criteria that tell us that this theory is better than that theory, given the evidence. And that's what we call the scientific method. We need a method of appraisal to tell us which theory is better, in this case theory two, given the available evidence. That's what the method is. It tells you which theory, which competing theory you have to choose if you take that evidence. So this is your definition of method. A set of requirements, criteria, rules, standards, and so forth, for employment in theory assessment, evaluation, appraisal, comparison. Now, these are all synonyms. So in literature, you may come across a formulation that says a set of criteria for theory evaluation or a set of rules for theory appraisal, a set of standards for theory comparison. So it can be any pair of this. Don't get confused. They all refer to the method. It's all the same thing, okay? I'll give you some examples. Here's one. Accept theories that are more simple, whatever makes them simple. This would be an example of a method. Or, alternatively, accept theories that provide confirmed novel predictions. Or, accept theories that solve more problems. Or, accept theories that are precise and accurate. All these are examples of methods. I'm not saying this is what we actually employ in theory assessment, okay? That may or may not be the case. We don't know at this stage. But these are some examples of methods which we may employ. Let's zoom out. So this is what method is. Set of criteria for theory evaluation. Two more clarifications before we move on. The first one, methods should not be confused with methodologies. When we say methodology, we mean something openly formulated, something explicitly stated. Basically, methodology is a set of explicit requirements, theory assessment. That's what scientists say the real science should be about. Method is a different thing. Method, basically, is your implicit expectations. Here you have methodology. These are the rules openly prescribed by the community as the correct way of doing science. And method, those are your actual implicit expectations, your gut feelings, if you want. Think of a movie review. Let's say you watch a movie and you say, well, it was a waste of time. You certainly have some implicit expectations as to what a decent movie should be like. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to say that. So you have some implicit expectations. That would be that set of implicit expectations, whether you know about them or not, would be your method of movie assessment. And then I ask you, I say, can you write down your criteria? How you ended up saying that the movie was a waste of time. Then you sit down, you try to explicate your implicit expectations. You try to come up with a, with a list of requirements. And then the thing is, your openly formulated requirements may or may not be the same as your actual expectations. Very often, we have no idea how we evaluate things. Think about, you know, finding a proper partner. If people ask me, how, how do you evaluate those things? Well, you know, I can try really hard and sit down and come up with a huge list of requirements. She should be like, you know, it should be funny, clever, and you know, all sorts of things. But then once in a while, I end up liking a girl who's nothing like that. You know, people who know me, they know it's, it's, it's And you know from your own experiences, <laughs> it's nothing like that. So the bottom line is, you may or may not have an openly stated methodology, but you do have a method. You see the difference here? You may or may not be aware of what it is that guides you in your choices. That would be your methodology. But you do have a method, your implicit and tacit expectations, which allow you to choose between competing girlfriends or competing whatever, competing theories. This is what scientists say they should be doing. That's methodology. And this here, method, is what scientists actually do. Albert Einstein once said, very famously, he said, if you really want to understand what science is all about, don't listen to what scientists say they do. Look at what they actually do. 
So basically what he was asking us to do is not to focus on methodology, but focus on the method, on the actual expectations. And they are never on the surface. They're very difficult, often very difficult to unearth. But that's what we have to try and understand. It's not the methodology that does the job, it's the method that does the job. Clear? All agreed? Very good. Another thing that we have to keep separate from method is research techniques. In literature, in popular literature, in science literature, when they say method, they mean two things. They mean, first and foremost, a set of requirements for employment in theory assessment. That's true. But in addition to that, you also come across, and very often, you come across a usage of methods as a set of procedures for theory construction. In philosophy, we distinguish between the two. It's one thing how we arrive at a theory or how we generate an idea. That's one thing. It's another thing how we assess that idea. So for instance, I'm trying to come up with a solution to a given problem, anything. And then I say, well, I've heard that brainstorming is a good technique. Let's sit down in a group and brainstorm. That would be a research technique. The product of that brainstorming may or may not be correct. How do we know that it's correct? Well, you have to apply certain methods to evaluate whether they're correct or not. So philosophically speaking, we're not really interested in research techniques. We're not interested how people come up with ideas. You could see it in your dreams. You could have downloaded it from somewhere, stolen it from somewhere. Maybe some aliens told you about that. Does it make any difference scientifically where the theory comes from? Who cares? It's interesting if you study you know, intellectual biographies of, of different scientists, that one might be very interesting, but we don't really care. That doesn't make a theory any more true, does it? So research techniques, we're gonna put them aside. We're not gonna be talking about them. So it's all about method. This brings us to our problem. If there were a fixed set of rules employed by the scientific community in theory assessment, then we would be in a position to say that our current theories here are better than the theories of the past. And the whole process of scientific change would be governed by this fixed and universal scientific method. So theories would change, but the method would remain. You see, the whole process would be rational if there only were this universal and unchangeable scientific method, if we only had that. And the question is, is there such a thing as an unchangeable method of science? Suppose there is. Suppose for the sake of argument that there is. Now the question is, what is that method? What are the requirements of that unchangeable scientific method? So let's try to explicate those requirements. You understand that these requirements are not going to be on the surface. What we have to do, we have to study specific transitions in the mosaic and try to understand why was it that this particular theory became accepted instead of that theory. And only that would give us some idea as to what the actual expectations of the community were. You following? So this is what we're going to do. Let's take a basic example, very, very straightforward example. A law of free fall. The law here says that the distance traveled by a falling object is proportional to the square of the time traveled. Now what would it take for this theory to become accepted? What do you think? What should we do? Any ideas? How do we test this? I would assume that you'd have to do some sort of experiment. To you have to see whether it fits the data, right? Yeah. You have to actually go out there and observe and see whether it fits the data. Very straightforward. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a falling object, then we're going to try and deduce specific predictions from this equation, like that. This is the time and the distance traveled. Okay, this is going to be our prediction for every tenth of a second. And then we have to try and see whether that actually holds, whether it actually fits the, the actual data, like that. And we see that it does. And this will be enough, this will be sufficient to convince us that the equation is correct. The general idea is very straightforward, whether it fits the data. Now, unfortunately, not everything is this simple. In many cases, we know that precision and accuracy are not enough. Very often, we expect something more than just precision and accuracy. We expect the so-called confirmed novel predictions or predictions of things which are hitherto unobserved. 
something that nobody has ever observed before. I'm going to give you a historical example here. We're going to go back all the way to the 17th century, the late 17th century. What's the year? 1687? This is the year when Isaac Newton created his theory. That's not the year when it became accepted. This is the year when the theory was created. So this is the theory. And the theory had a bunch of laws. First law, second law, third law, law of gravity, then Newton's laws. And what happened is that it became very clear from the outset that this theory is very, very precise when it comes to explanation of a whole bunch of phenomena. Terrestrial phenomena, celestial phenomena, it was very precise and very accurate. More accurate than any of other theories, any of other available theories on the market. So in terms of precision and accuracy, there was nothing like it. And this was clear from the outset. Everybody appreciated this. And yet it took about half a century before this theory became accepted. Now the question is, why is that? Why would it take another half a century for the theory to become accepted? Well, because the community was expecting confirmed novel predictions, predictions of things which are not yet observed. Luckily, the theory made such a prediction. The theory predicted that if you take our planet, the Earth, this would be the polar diameter, right? This would be the equatorial diameter. And the theory says that the Earth is oblate, slightly flattened towards the poles, basically orange-shaped, if you want slightly flattened towards the poles. This type of spheroid is called oblate. This is what the theory predicted. And it took the scientific community about 50 years to actually confirm that. Now, why would they bother with this? Why would they actually try to confirm this? Well, that's because the accepted theory at the time was the one created by René Descartes, the Cartesian theory. And according to that theory, the Earth was supposed to be lemon-shaped, prolate, slightly elongated towards the poles. This was the accepted view back then. And it took the scientific community huge efforts and huge determination. Two very expensive expeditions were sent in different parts of the globe to measure the length of one degree of arc. That's how they discover the actual shape of the Earth. You measure the difference between any two degrees. First, you measure the distance between any two degrees around the equator and then somewhere up north. And if the two numbers are the same, then the Earth is a perfect sphere. If the number grows as you move northward, then it shows that your sphere is oblate, that is flattened towards poles. And if the number decreases, then it's an indication that it's prolate. This is the basic idea. In the 1730s, there were two expeditions which were sent to confirm this. One was sent to Lapland, that's contemporary Sweden, Finland, up north, and the other one was sent to Peru. Well, actually, contemporary Ecuador. Back then it was Peru. Why Ecuador? The Spanish speakers know that it means equator, right? Because we had to get as close to the equator as possible. That's the reason. Anyways, the theory became accepted on the continent only after the confirmation of this novel prediction. Now, you would say, well, why is that? Why is it that in some cases, precision and accuracy are sufficient, while in other cases, precision and accuracy are not enough. Why is that? Scientists seem to be behaving differently in different cases, but why is that? I think the answer has to do with the concept of accepted ontology. What is ontology? Ontology is basically the set of views about entities and interactions that populate the world. So if I say that I believe that the world is populated by quarks and leptons and bosons, that would be an ontological statement. The contemporary science, for instance, has its own ontology. The science of the past had its own ontology. I believe that our attitude towards a theory depends on whether that theory tries to convince us that there is a new ontological element. It depends on whether the theory tries to modify the accepted ontology. If a theory, let's say, introduces a new particle or a new force, or a new interaction, we say, no, 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 no. Precision and accuracy is not sufficient. You have to do better than that. If, on the other hand, the theory just tries to come up with an equation that creates a link between any two known quantities, then we'll say, yeah, just show us that it's, uh, it's precise and accurate. So I think what we have in mind is something along these lines. I'm going to give you a nice flow chart. So the question is, does a new theory try to modify the accepted ontology? If it does not, 
then a mere precision and accuracy are sufficient. Just go out there, do as many experiments as you can, make sure that the predictions of your theory fit the available data, and you're fine. Your theory will become accepted, just like in a case of a law of free fall. But if you try to convince us that there are new forces, new particles, new super strings, whatever, if you're trying to convince us that our ontology is not correct, that we have to change something in our ontology, then, well, we will require some more extraordinary evidence. This is basically what Carl Sagan had in mind when he said, extraordinary hypotheses require extraordinary evidence. This is basically that intuition. I'm going to give you a few examples here. First, precision and accuracy. We're going to go all the way back to the late 18th century. 1785, this is the year when the French physicist Charles-Augustin de Coulomb formulated his famous law of electrostatic force. This is the law. It says you have two point charges, Q1 and Q2, and this is the distance between them. The opposite charges attract each other. Like charges repel each other. And the law says that the force of attraction or repulsion between the two point charges is proportional to the product of magnitude, meaning Q1 and Q2, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, like that. This is very similar to Newton's law of gravity, as you can see. In form, it's very similar. And the idea is different. So you have two point charges, you have a distance, and this is the equation. If you have a look at this, this law didn't introduce any new entities. It didn't introduce any new interactions. People knew about point charges. People knew about the fact that they attract each other, repel each other. They knew about it. What was missing, what was lacking, is an equation that would show us the relation between a force and a charge and a distance. We didn't have that equation, and he provided us with one. He wasn't trying to convince us that our accepted ontology is incorrect. He was trying just to come up with some equation that connects things that we already know. And that's what he did. And this is the reason why the theory became accepted without any confirmed novel predictions. The moment it became obvious that the theory provides predictions that are accurate and precise, it became accepted. All right? Now let's consider another example. 1810, this is 25 years later. At the time, the accepted theory of light was the so-called corpuscular theory of light. This is the theory. It was believed at the time that light is made of tiny particles, corpuscles. And it followed from that that corpuscles of light travel in straight lines with a finite velocity. Because they're made of particles, therefore they sh should be subject to the same laws just like any other particle. They should travel in straight lines unless they are affected by an obstacle, let's say a mirror or something. Other than that, they should travel in straight lines. Let's take a basic setup. We have a source of light, we have a wall, and we have a disk in the center. Since light particles travel in straight lines, then no light corpuscle will end up in a shadowed region. It's very straightforward because since light is composed of tiny particles, therefore, some of the particles would be blocked by the disk. Other particles will continue traveling in straight lines. Essentially, as a result of this, you would get a uniform shadow. This was the accepted belief at the time. Now, 1819, this is the year when another Frenchman, Augustin Jean Fresnel, proposed his wave theory of light. This was a completely different theory. I like the accepted theory. This theory was trying to convince us that light is a wave. It's a wave that spreads in your universally present medium, ether. So this is similar to water waves when you drop a stone. You drop a stone and it propagates. It's very similar to the idea of water wave. And it followed from that that light waves can diffract and interfere when they meet obstacles. Again, similar to water waves. Say I'm a water wave, there's an obstacle in front of me. What happens is I reach the obstacle, then I bend behind the obstacle. This is what happens with light as well, according to Fresnel. This was a new theory. So if we take the same setup, when the light waves reach the edges of the disk, according to this theory, some waves would continue in the same direction. But there would be others which would diffract. And as a result of this, you would have to get a very tiny bright spot in the center of the shadow. This was the novel prediction of the theory, something never observed before. And what do you know? 
The prediction was confirmed the same year by Francois Arago and the theory became accepted. Let's take a contemporary case. If I ask you what's the theory that we nowadays accept when it comes to fundamental particles and forces, you'd say, well, it's the standard model of quantum physics. Everybody knows that. You have quarks, you have leptons, you have bosons. This is basically your zoo of particles. Fermions here, quarks and leptons, they make up ordinary matter, everything around you. These ones here, the so-called gauge bosons, they are the ones that transmit forces, strong force, weak force. And this is the recently discovered Higgs boson, which is the one responsible for giving other particles mass. But if it comes to pursuit theories, you say, well, it's, it's all about superstring theories. What superstring theory? I'm not going to explain you the theory, but basic idea is that all known particles, all those particles, quarks, leptons, bosons, they are the effects of vibrations of the so-called supersymmetric strings or superstrings in an 11-dimensional space. So don't think of this as, you know, strings on your guitar. That's, that's not what the theory says. What this says is that our space here, of course, the space that we inhabit, appears to be three-dimensional. We all know that, x, y, z. But in reality, the theory says, the world is 11-dimensional. So two particles, which are very far removed from each other in the three-dimensional space, may turn out to be part of the same superstring in an 11-dimensional space. They may turn out to be connected. And this, if this turns out to be the case, this would explain such phenomena as quantum non-locality, if you've ever heard of that. When you have a particle here and a particle very far removed from this one, and then you do something on this particle and the other particle changes over there. According to our theories, well, that phenomena must exist, but then we don't really understand how it's possible. If this theory were correct, then that phenomena would be explained because it would turn out that those particles which are seemingly far from each other, in reality, they are connected through other dimensions. Well, it's a crazy idea and we do not accept this idea for now, but we pursue the idea. So what it says that all these particles here, they are results of vibrations of the superstring. So basically, it explains the known particles and forces by postulating the existence of superstrings. This is what the theory does. Now, superstrings are a new entity, aren't they? It's a new ontological entity. So what would it take us to accept this theory? What should be done to make sure that the theory becomes accepted? Would the uh, mere precision and accuracy be enough here? I'll tell you from the outset, this theory is very precise and accurate. It's so constructed so that it reproduces each and every prediction of quantum physics. So in terms of its accuracy and precision, it's as accurate and as precise as the accepted theory, and yet we do not accept it. Why is that? I'm Danny, and we'd need uh, representative evidence that these superstrings really do exist. Very good. So basically, the theory postulates a new ontological entity. And we're not going to allow any theory that is merely precise to change our ontology. You're not going to be convinced. I'll give you another example. Suppose I come up with a theory, a physical theory, which postulates the existence of tiny little angels tiny, tiny, very tiny, within quarks, let's say. I believe that there are these tiny angels, and the theory is created in such a way that it reproduces each and every prediction of our accepted theory, right? So in terms of precision and accuracy, suppose for the sake of argument, in terms of precision and accuracy, my theory of tiny angels is as precise as the accepted physical theory. Would you accept it? Say, no, Jacob, come on. If you postulate the existence of new ontological entities, you really have to try very hard to convince the community. The mere accuracy and precision are not going to be enough. Why is that? Well, because we know that everyone can be smart after the fact. Specifically, especially when you know how to reproduce the predictions of a previous theory. You just take the equations of a previous theory, you may or may not even change them, but you can postulate some other ontological entities in such a way that the same set of predictions is produced. Everyone might be smart after the fact. So in order to avoid possible problems here, what we do, we say, well, you know what? You want to convince us in something this bold? You have to try very hard. You have to try and show that 
There are things that you predict, but we never expect it. And it's the absence of confirmed novel predictions that is the reason, not one of the reasons, but the reason why physicists nowadays merely pursue the theory. They do not accept it. There's a, there's a decent chance that it'll take us decades or even maybe even centuries to test this theory. So at the moment, the theory is not accepted. It's merely pursued. Is this clear? Yeah? Because this is so, like there's such a decent chance that it'll take us so long, why is this being pursued over something else? So your question is, if we're not sure whether it's going to be accepted or not, why do we pursue those things? Well, I think the answer is very clear, because we want to understand how the world is. How do we determine what's more important than the other to pursue? It's a question that I don't think has a reasonable answer. I don't think it has. Uh, it's a question that anyone who works for a grant agency faces sooner than later. You have all these different applications. One is by this guy named Albert Einstein, and he proposes that he might develop a theory in which space-time actually curves. You're going to fund that? It's difficult. It's difficult. It's always a risk. It's very difficult to say from the outset what's going to become of an idea. I don't believe that you have to actually limit the development of certain ideas. But you have to be brave enough and understand that you're taking a risk. It may or may not pay off. Right, let's sum it up here. So basically, this is what we have. In some cases, we seem to be satisfied by mere accuracy and precision. In other cases, we seem to require confirmed novel predictions. Together, if I zoom out, put it here, this would be what we nowadays call the hypothetical deductive method. It basically says that you are allowed to hypothesize. It is OK to hypothesize about the internal structure of the world. That's totally fine. This is what science, the real science, is all about provided that some of the novel predictions of your theory are actually confirmed. This is basically the idea. Propose a hypothesis, go out there, test it. If your hypothesis is such that it tries to modify the accepted ontology, then you have to come up with confirmed novel predictions. If not, then a mere accuracy and precision would suffice. This is what we call the hypothetical deductive method. And I think it's safe to say that nowadays this is what actual working scientists have in mind when they evaluate competing theories. My question is, is this method unchangeable? Is this method transhistorical, fixed? This is the question. Again, if we suppose for the sake of argument that this is the method of science, the contemporary science, is this method unchangeable? Is this the fixed method of science? And there's no other way of saying this. The answer is no. No, it isn't. I'm going to show a few examples from the history of science. First, we're going to go all the way back to the early 17th century. This is the time of Galileo. If we observe, if we had a chance to observe what the scientists back then were expecting from theories, we would see that their expectations had nothing to do whatsoever with our hypothetical deductive method. Well, for them, a proposition or a theory was acceptable if one of two conditions was met. If it grasped the nature of a thing through intuition, I'll explain it, or it followed deductively from intuitive propositions. So basically, back then, if you wanted to convince your peers, the scientific community, you would have to show that the theory that you have is intuitively true, meaning it's based on common sense that any educated person in the field would say, of course, we know that. So this idea of intuition based on experience should not be confused with the contemporary idea of intuition. Oh, you know, I have this gut feeling. No, that's not what they're referring to. What they had in mind is that if you want to understand the nature of bees, then you don't go and ask your favorite barber. You have to go and find a beekeeper, a person who is experienced with that type of things, bees in this case, and ask that person, what is it that constitutes the nature of bees. And if you're experienced with bees, so the story goes, you are in a position to say what their nature is. Maybe the answer would be to produce honey, I don't know. Similarly, if you want to understand what the nature of human beings is, you don't go and ask, or maybe you may go and ask your favorite barber, he may know a thing or two about the nature of human beings, but probably your first choice, according to the Aristotelians, would be to go and ask a professional philosopher. 
a person who is experienced enough with human beings. It was, it's some weird understanding what philosophers are doing, really. <laughs> Anyways, this is the idea. As a result of that, you would have to have an axiomatic deductive system in which your fundamental axioms would be grasped intuitively by an experienced person and the rest of your system would be deduced from axioms. So if you lived in the early 17th century and you had this grand idea of the Earth being not in the center of the universe but being one of the planets revolving around the sun, how would you ever convince your peers that this idea really makes sense? By confirmed novel predictions? Let's see if it works. 1543, this is the year when Copernicus proposed his theory. And according to the theory, there you have it, if we zoom in here, in this region, you have the Sun, the Earth, and Venus. Now you have the picture from the perspective of the Earth. This is Venus. Since Venus, according to this theory, revolves not around the Earth, but around the Sun, we must be able to observe, we here on the Earth, observers, we must be able to observe the full set of phases of Venus, like that. You see? Full set of phases, from a crescent, first quarter, and so on and so forth, all the way to new Venus, full set of phases. And this here was one of the novel predictions of Copernicus's theory. Why was it a novel prediction? Because the theory accepted back then predicted something completely different. The theory that was accepted at the time, Ptolemaic theory, or something along the lines of Ptolemaic theory, again, we zoom in in this region. You see, they did believe that everything revolves around the Earth. But when you observe the motion of celestial bodies, the planets, then planets appear to be moving not in perfect circles, but something like that here, you see? They sometimes retrograde. So if you're the Earth and I'm the planet, they go forward most of the time, but sometimes they stop and go backward a little bit, make a little turn, and they go forward again. So most of the time they go forward, but sometimes they retrograde. So how would you explain this sort of motion with circles? Ptolemy had an ingenious idea. He said, well, you know what? In order to explain that, in order to reproduce that motion, we have to hypothesize that every planet revolves in a small circle, and I'm going to call that epicycle. You have an epicycle for every planet. And then this epicycle here moves along a larger circle called deferent, and the deferent itself revolves around the Earth. So you put all motions together, this motion here, a revolution of uh, the epicycle, and the revolution of the deferent. You put them together, and this is what you get. Have a look. You see? Ingenious. Absolutely false, obviously, but ingenious. This is what they believe is the case. And the interesting thing about this theory, it actually allowed you to predict future positions of every planet with utmost precision, at least for that time period. Now, in this theory, if you consider the motion of Venus, this is Venus again, this would be Venus's epicycle, this would be Venus's deferent, you would never be in a position to observe the full set of Venus's phases. So people back then believed that, at best, you could see it half lit. This would be the first quarter, and after that you would have a crescent again, and then you would get a new Venus. You would never have a full Venus. Okay? And then it would be another crescent, another quarter, another crescent, and another new Venus. So, at best, you can only see it half lit. Makes sense, right? Because it revolves around the Earth, according to the theory. So what happened? Around 1610, Galileo actually managed to confirm a Copernican prediction. He managed to confirm that, yes, you actually see the full set of phases. So if it were nowadays, we'd say, well, there you have it, a confirmed old prediction. Theory must be accepted, right? We have that intuition nowadays. But back then it wasn't accepted. Why is that? If you ask that guy, he would say, I told you, those guys were just stupid, irrevocably stupid, you know, the clergy of the time. But his opponents would say, no. The reason is that nobody cares about confirmed old predictions. The requirements of our method are different. What we expect is intuitive truth. And your theory is anything but intuitive. So you really, really honestly believe that this whole thing revolves around anything? Why is it that nobody feels anything? Why would even God bother to create such a thing? But you know the main reason why they didn't believe in the revolving and rotating Earth. 
and the main reason being their physics. You remember the Aristotelian physics. If you accept that physics, then the Earth, which is a combination of element Earth and element water, must necessarily be in the center of the universe. So for them, it wasn't just a random choice. It was something that followed from their physics. And there you have it. Galileo, who tried to convince everyone that the whole thing revolves and do it in a wrong way. And that's the reason why nobody was convinced. In the middle of the century, 1644, this is the year when René Descartes proposed his theory. And this was the theory that actually managed to convince the community of the time. It is with this theory that heliocentrism, the idea of the sun being in the center, became accepted. Not before that. And Descartes, he was a smart guy. He knew the rules of the game. He knew that there's no way to convince the Aristotelian community unless you make sure that your theory appears intuitively true. So what you have to do, you have to play the game the way the rules tell you to play. Okay, Galileo didn't understand that. That's why he failed. Descartes understood that. And there are passages in Descartes when he makes this clear. He says, well, I'm not doing anything different from what you Aristotelians tell me to do. I'm just trying to build a system which is intuitively true. And in order to make sure that my system is even truer than that of Aristotle, I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to erase everything and only accept those things which are absolutely true, which are beyond any reasonable doubt. You see what he's trying to do? He's trying to create a system that would convince the Aristotelian community. I'm going to only give you one fragment of that theory. Let's take a material object, something material. What are the qualities, says Descartes, that every material object must necessarily have? Well, we have five candidates, says Descartes. We have color, sound, taste, smell, and shape. We have five candidates. These are the properties that material objects normally have. Now, which of these properties are indispensable? Meaning, can you think of a material object that doesn't have color, for instance? Can you or can you not? Can you think of something material, yet colorless, transparent? Clearly, you can do that. Therefore, color is not indispensable. You can think of material things like air. Air occupies space, right? It's material. And yet, it doesn't have color. Therefore, this is not an indispensable quality of matter. So this is not a fundamental property. Therefore, this must go. Can you think of objects that don't make any sound? Clearly, you can do that. Therefore, sound is also not indispensable. The same applies to taste. There are objects that don't have any taste. Smell is the same thing. Not everything smells. And thank goodness that not everything smells. <laughs> but when it comes to this, when it comes to shape, Descartes says you cannot possibly conceive of a material object that does not occupy some space. It could be a fixed, limited space, just like the remote control, not that they had any remote controls back then, but you get the idea. Or it could be some fuzzy space, like air, but there must be some space. So if you happen to come across a material object that does not occupy any space, well, it's not much of a material object, is it? If it's material, it must occupy some space. It could be very tiny space, you know, very, very, very tiny, or it can be a huge space, but there must be some space. And if it doesn't occupy any space, it's not material. So you cannot possibly think of something material that doesn't occupy space, says Descartes. Make sense? And this brings him to his fundamental principle, that matter is extension. That the fundamental property of matter is extension, the capacity to occupy space. Once you accept this, several interesting conclusions follow. For one, says Descartes, material objects are composed of bits of interacting matter. Really, think about it. If the only thing that a material object can do is to occupy some space, then therefore everything in the universe is composed of just things that occupy space. It's just a tautology in a sense. Only small tiny bits which can only interact with each other. And how do they interact? Only by actual contact. Think of billiard balls. How can one billiard ball affect another one? Just by touching, just by actual contact. And this is Descartes' fundamental idea, that the only way one bit of matter can interact with another bit of matter is not at a distance, is not by somehow affecting the other one at a distance. 
there's no such thing. Only by actual contact. So the whole world is a mechanism. The whole world is like a clockwork, with levers and springs and clocks and what have you. This is the idea of the mechanistic universe. The interesting thing about this whole theory was basically an attempt to convince the community of the time. You see how he arrives at that? No experiments, no observations. Just pure intuition, and the rest is just deduction. And he says, now you Aristotelians, look at this. Isn't this intuitively true? Of course it is intuitively true. We just arrived at it together. So I'm just playing your game, the game that you want me to play. And this is intuitively true. And again, this is an essential difference. Difference from Galileo, if you think about it. On the continent, Descartes' theory became accepted at the turn of the century. This is the basic point. It was accepted not because it had confirmed all predictions, not because it was precise and accurate, but because it was intuitively true. Now, let's sum it up. Is there an unchangeable method of science? Unchangeable meaning fixed and transhistorical. If you say yes, this would bring you to the so-called static method thesis, the idea that the method of science is unchangeable. If you say no, then you would arrive at the dynamic method thesis, which says that method of science changes through time. Okay? If I asked you, what are the arguments against the static method thesis? What would you say, now that I told you this whole thing? We know that methods used in the past have changed over time, so that's kind of evidence that it does change. Exactly, very good. Historical record is your argument. We know from the history of science that the Aristotelian method had nothing to do with the hypothetical deductive method. And there was a transition from one to the other. We're going to study that transition next time. But essentially, we can all agree that a historical record shows that there is no such thing as a static method. The method of science changes through time. A little bit of history for you. If we went all the way back to the ancient Greeks and Aristotle here, Aristotle was one among many, many other scientists and philosophers who believed that there are certain fixed rules of conducting science. He believed that there is a fixed way of doing science. 2,000 years after Aristotle, this guy, Isaac Newton, he also believed that there is a certain set of rules for conducting science. In his programmatic work, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, in that, in that book in which he proposed the foundations of classical physics, here's a chapter when he outlines the list of rules which he believed were the rules of science. They had nothing to do with the actual expectations of the community of the time, to be sure, but the essential point is that he believed that the rules are fixed, that there is scientific method, a fixed scientific method. And even all the way to about 50 years ago, Karl Popper, he also believed that there is an unchangeable method of science. Now they all disagreed as to what that actual unchangeable method of science is. If you asked Aristotle, Newton and Popper to try and explicate that method, you would see there's a whole bunch of different opinions. Aristotle would say the actual method of science is all about intuitions and deductions. Newton would say it's about inductions from phenomena. And then Popper would say, no, it's all about falsification. Forget about these things. What you have to understand is that for the most part of the history of human knowledge, the idea of static method was taken for granted. People believed that theories change, yes, but something remains unchangeable. That's what they believed. This guy, anyone knows who this might be? This is the guy who wrote a famous treatise called Against Method. Anyone? Any philosophers here? Yeah? Paul Feyerabend. Paul Feyerabend, bingo. There is no unchangeable method of science. He said it among many others. Thomas Kuhn was another one who said that. And nowadays it is commonly accepted that there is no such thing as a fixed, unchangeable method of science. The methods change. So until the 1970s, it was believed that theories are evaluated by this fixed scientific method here. And therefore, only scientific theories change, you see? Only scientific theories change while the method remains unchangeable. And philosophers like their philosophical jargon, and they would say in this case that the method is transcendent, meaning that it's not part of the process of scientific change, that it's beyond the process, that it remains there unchangeable, okay? So this was what they believed to be the case, and nowadays we believe that there is no such thing. And as a result of that, we accept that methods 
are not something external to the mosaic. They are part of the mosaic. They are here. They are here. 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 They are part of the process of scientific change. And therefore, we have to redefine the concept of scientific mosaic. This was our original definition, the set of accepted theories. We have to redefine it. A set of accepted theories and employed methods. Make sense? Therefore, what undergoes scientific change is not only the theories, but also the methods. Next time I'm going to show you many examples of changes in methods. But at this point we have to appreciate that not only theories change, but also methods change. And this brings us to what is probably the most important question in the contemporary philosophy of science, if you ask my opinion. If there are no fixed methods, does it mean that the whole process of scientific change is irrational? Another way of putting it, why do we employ the hypothetical deductive method and not say the Aristotelian medieval method? Is this choice arbitrary? Alternatively, is there a certain logic that governs transitions from one method to the next? You see the dilemma here. If it turns out that the choice is completely random, that you can choose your methods of evaluation, I can choose my methods of evaluation, then we end up in what philosophers call absolute relativism. Your theory is better by your own standards, my theory is better by my own standards, I can have my own scientific community, you can have your own scientific community, and we all live happily ever after. That would be a grant agency's nightmare. <laughs> and not just grant agency, educator's nightmare. If you think about it, you know, I, I stand here, I have to teach you the accepted theories. Well, not me, really. I'm a philosopher, I can teach you anything. <laughs> but, if, but if you go to a science department, those guys would really be in trouble. So this is the question we're going to tackle next time. What is the mechanism of scientific change? We know how theories change when they meet the requirements of the method of the time. Very well. But how do the methods change? This question remains open. Any questions? We have a question. Hi, my name is Seon. So you're looking at the method, how the method changes, and then we're gonna, next time we're going to see how the fundamental idea of how the method changes, but what if that idea changes? So the question is very straightforward. We discovered that the method is changeable. Once we believed that it wasn't, now we discovered that it is changeable. Now we are going to try and come up with some kind of a mechanism that would explain how methods change. Then your question is, what if it turns out one day that that mechanism itself is also changeable? Is there a guarantee that it will never occur to us? No, there is no guarantee. But does it mean that we have to stop searching for something unchangeable? Again, we have to subscribe to the idea that the process might as well be endless. But does it mean that we have to just give up? After all, it's fun and it pays off mortgages, right? <laughs> Very good. So any other questions? Thank you very much. Have fun. Thank you.